Welcome to the wonderful world of Ghost Horse Hollow. I'm your host, Anne Severn Williamson, and this is my Family Book Nook. My Family Book Nook podcast is brought to you by the Owsley County Public Library in Boonville, Kentucky, and by Jackson Energy, a Touchstone Energy Cooperative, and by Ghost Horse Gifts, featuring the fine intaglio jewelry and gemstone sculpture of artisan Jack Williamson on the web at www.etsy.com slash shop slash ghost horse gifts. My family book nook features the saga of the McKinnon homesteaders 100 years in the future in the Appalachian wilderness. Listeners may wish to follow along in the fairy lore of Ghost Horse Hollow, available on Amazon Books and Kindle Readers, starting with Book One, Turn of the Blade. My family book nook also shares stories, myths, and legends from around the globe in support of world literacy, conservation, and cultural exchange. Our first story from around the world in support of literacy, conservation, and cultural exchange is Beowulf, as retold in a 1921 version from My Book House, edited by Olive Bupre Miller. Beowulf is a Scandinavian tale from the 6th or 7th century AD. The epic poem is one of the most significant works of Old English or Anglo-Saxon literature. The single copy is housed today in the British Library as part of the Noel Codex. The author is simply referred to as the Beowulf poet, writing somewhere between 975 and 1025 A.D. Listen for both the Christian and the pagan elements, the trolls and the demons. Beowulf may also have been a reference to Beowulf or the bear. How Beowulf Delivered Herald, retold from the old English epic, Beowulf. Lo, we have heard tell of the might and days of old of the Danish folk kings, how deeds of daring were done by their ethlings. For long in the walled towns was Hrothgar, the beloved folk king of the Silding, known to fame among the peoples. A great following of dear kinsfolk and young warriors dwelt in his hall and obeyed him gladly. Then it burned in his spirit to bid men build him a dwelling greater than children of men had ever heard tell of, and there within it to share with old and young the blessings that God had given him. On all his kindred, far and wide through the mid-earth, was the task laid of making fair the folk hall. Speedily it befell that it was in every wise ready the greatest of hall houses, and he made for it the name of Heorot, which is to say, the stag. The hall rose lofty and broad-gabled, made out of timber, its steep roof plated with gold that shone from afar. The main pillar at each end rose high above the gable peak, carven and painted, bearing antlers of the stag. Spoils of the chase decked it without. Within it was hung with hangings. Then Hrothgar belied not his pledge unto his kinsmen and retainers, but held a great feast when the hall was complete, dealing out generously unto them rings and plates of gold, brooches, collars, armlets, swords, and treasures in abundance. Each day was heard loud rejoicing in the hall, with sound of harp and clear song of gleeman. So the warriors lived in joy and plenty, till a foul fiend, 
fell prowler about the borders of the homes of men, heard their rejoicing, and being enemy of all mankind, a lonely one, terrible, himself bereft of joy, could not abide that others should be happy, this grim demon, who trod in man's shape the path of exile, save that he was greater in size than any man, held the moors, the fins, and fastnesses, and was called Grendel. When night had come, Grendel came to spy about the house, and see how the Danes had left it after the feasting. There he found a company of Aethlings asleep, the baneful white, grim and greedy, fierce and pitiless, man-devouring, slew where they rested all those thirty thanes. Thence fared he back homeward, exultant with his spoils. At dawn, with break of day, came servants to the place. There was the mead-hall, that lordly dwelling, empty of aethlings, with bench-boards overturned and everywhere signs of struggle. The cry of those who saw brought Hrothgar to the spot. He looked about and found gigantic footsteps leading from the hall to the sluggish waters of a mountain tarn, the dwelling-place of Grendel. Then was weeping upraised in Herod, after all their glad feasting. Sorrow of soul was theirs, and mood of mourning. The king himself sat joyless, sorrowing for his things. Nor was it longer than after one night that Grendel again wrought murderous destruction still more grievous. Too old was the white-haired Hrothgar, friend of the people, to fare forth himself to meet Grendel. Full often boasted his war's men that they would await in the mead-hall the monster. Whenever they did so, by just so many the less were the king's thanes numbered next day. At last could the aethlings no more sleep in the hall, but must find a place of rest apart, till the fairest of dwellings stood idle and useless, so soon as the evening's light had faded from the heavens. Thus had Grendel mastery and ward against the right, he alone against all. A great while it was, twelve winters, that the king endured this woe, the grisly monster, the dark death shadow, rested not in pursuit of young and old. Night after night he held the misty moors, and in this wise wrought many an outrage. So without ceasing Hrothgar brooded his season of sorrow, despairing of succor. In due course it became known openly to the children of men, as Gleeman sang the sorrowful song abroad, how Grindel strove against Hrothgar. So it chanced that Beowulf, the Geat, thane of Hygelac, king of the Geat folk, heard tell of the tale when he was from home. Strongest in might of manhood was Beowulf, noble and powerful. Out of largeness of soul he bade be fitted for him a good sea-goer, and said he would fare over the whale-path, over the waters, to seek out Hrothgar and aid him to master the foe. Then the valiant-minded hero took to himself picked warriors of the Geat folk, the boldest he might find. They bare their bright trappings, wore gear splendrous into the vessel, and shoved out the well-joined wood on its willing journey over the swan road. Sped by the wind, the foamy-necked ship glided the waters, likest a bird, till on the day following the seafarers saw the land, the shore-cliffs gleaming before them. Thereupon the Geat folk sprang to the beach and fastened their vessel. God they thanked, because the wave-paths had proved easy for them. Then from the steep shore the warden of the Sildings, whose duty it was to keep watch of the sea-cliffs, saw the war's men bear over the bulwarks their shining shields and gear ready as for battle. Their burnies, the hard, hard-linked hand-armor of metal rings, gleamed from afar, and on their gold-decked helmets graven boars crept watch as if grimly warlike of temper. The warden was fretted in his mind's thought, with a wish to know what men they were. "'What men are ye, having battle gear, clad in burnies?' he shouted. "'Who thus come leading a deep ship hither over the sea-road, over the waters?' 
We have come with kind intent to seek thy lord, said Beowulf, and made known his race and errand to those shores. I gather that this fellowship is of true thought toward the lord of the Sildings, spake the warden in answer, and guided the geat folk till they saw before them, splendid and covered with gold, the timbered house where the king dwelt, that was among earth-dwellers famed beyond all others of halls under heaven. The sheen of it flashed over many lands. A cobbled street led them further. Thus they came faring first to the hall, and were led by a warrior, where Hrothgar sat, old and with hair exceeding white, among his band of aethlings. Then spake Beowulf, Refuse me not one boon, O prince of the bright Danes, guardian of warriors, beloved friend of the people, that I alone with my band of earls may cleanse Herod by my single hand, that I may bring Grendel the demon to judgment. So Harathgar bade Beowulf welcome, and told in sorrow of the soul the story of Grendel, the horror that had encompassed him. A bench was set for the strong-hearted ones, the Geatsmen, and all were bidden to feast together. The king sat on his high seat at the head of the hall, his retainers and guests at tables on a raised platform along the sides of the room, where a fire blazed red on the earthen floor in the centre of the chamber. A thane looked to the task set him, to bear in his hands the fretted alstup, and pour out the shining mead. Now and again the gleemen sang clear. There was joy among the warriors and laughter of heroes. Viltio, the queen, in her deckings of gold, came forth, mindful of courtly custom to pass the mead cup. She greeted the men in the hall, and then, as wife freeborn, gave the cup first to the king. He in gladness partook of the feast and the hall cup. Then the proud thoughted queen, decked with her diadem, went about to old and young in every part, giving the gemmed beaker, till the time came that she should bring it to Beowulf. She greeted the lord of the Geats, and thanked God for the coming of one to help in their trouble. Then answered Beowulf, Either I will do deeds that shall free your people wholly, or fall in the fray, fast, in the fiend's grip. These words pleased the lady. In her deckings of gold she passed on to sit, the free-born folk queen beside her lord. Then again, as erstwhile, was brave speech spoken in the hall. In gladness were the people told Hrothgar had a mind suddenly to seek his evening's rest, for he knew that an onslaught was purposed in the hall, by the monster so soon as they might no more see the sun's light, when night should grow dusk over all, and creatures of the shadow realm come stalking, dark, beneath the sky. Then Hrothgar, lord of the Sildings, and Vithio, his wife, went forth from the hall with their troop of warriors. Beowulf and his men were left alone in the place, Truly the prince of the Geats put ready trust in his bold might and in the Lord's grace. He took off his iron burney and all his war gear he slayed aside. With my hand grip shall I join with the fiend, he cried, and at the end may the wise God, the holy Lord, award the mastery of either hand as seemeth him meet. Then the brave one in battle mounted his bed, and about him many a hardy seafarer bowed him to his hall rest. Not one of them thought that he, thereafter, should ever again seek his loved home, his people, or the free town where he was reared. But the Lord gave help and aid to the Geatsmen, such that, through one man's strength, the foe was defeated. The truth is made known that the mighty God ruleth mankind from everlasting. In the dark night came striding the walker in shadow. From the moor, from under the misty fells, came Grindel striding. Under the clouds he went, till he might see without trouble the mead hall, the treasure house of men, brave with gold. So came he, the warring one, 
severed from joy, the door fastened with bars, forged in the fire, soon gave way when he laid hold of it with his hands. Bent on evil, puffed up with wrath, he break open the mouth of the hall. Quickly then the fiend trod in on the shining floor, strode on, fierce of mood. An unlovely light, likest to flame, stood in his eyes. He saw in the hall many warriors sleeping. Then his heart laughed within him. He thought the grisly monster to have a fill of feasting. But Beowulf, bold of heart, was watching intently. For a beginning Grendel seized quickly on a sleeping thane and devoured him. Then he stretched out his claw to reach for the hero. With set purpose, Beowulf grasped that arm in a hand grip that had the strength of thirty. Soon found that harder of evils that never in any other man had he met with a mightier hand grip. Grendel was affrighted, mind and heart. His one thought was to get him gone. He was minded to flee into the darkness, away to his fen lairs, to seek the drove of devils. But he could not get his arm free. Then the lordly hall grew clamorous with din of struggle. Mead benches, many decked with gold, fell on and over the floor. The thanes awoke, and panic fell on all who heard the outcry. God's foe yelling out his stave of terror, his song of defeat. Then found he that before in mirth of mood have wrought mankind many evils, that his body would avail him not. Much too strongly that one held him, who had of men the strongest might in this life's day. The grisly monster struggling, wrenching his own arm at last clean from the socket. To the fin fells he must flee away wounded unto death, but with the valorous one he left his arm and claw. So was fame of the battle given to Beowulf. So had the wise one and bold cleansed Herot, and saved it from peril. In the morning, from far and near, the leaders of the people fared through the wide ways to see the tracks of the foe, to scan the way he trod after his undoing. How worsted in the fight, he bare himself away to die in the mere of the monsters. Back then, from the mere of their joyful way, went riding the old tried comrades, men of valor, on their dapple greys, and many a youth likewise measuring the yellow road with his courser. The king himself also walked in stately wise from the queen's bower with a great company, and the queen, with her train of women, paced up the path beside him to the mead hall, where hung the claw of the fiend, the trophy of victory. Thus Hrothgar spake, Now hath a man, through the Lord's might, done a deed, we might none of us compass aforetime for all our wisdom. Now will I love thee, Beowulf, best of men, as a son in my own heart. May the Almighty requite thee with good, as till now he hath ever done. Forthwith Hrothgar bade men deck Herod and prepare a feast. Gleaming with gold shone the hangings on the wall. In reward for his victory, the king gave Beowulf a golden standard, a broidered war banner, a helmet and burney, and other mighty treasures. He made eight steeds, their harness heavy with gold, to be led indoors on the floor of the hall. These likewise he gave to Beowulf. Nor were the earls who came with Beowulf over the swan road unrewarded with gifts. Then came forth Viltio, the queen, under her golden diadem, to give her gifts to the conqueror. Sounds and songs of playing were heard in the hall. Again rose the revel, the clamor along the benches resounded clear. When that event came, Hrothgar led Beowulf and his men to sleep in a place of honor apart from the hall. But there remained to keep watch in Hirot, unnumbered Danish earls, for they thought that all danger was past. Through the length of the raised platform, they spread beds and pillows. Their weapons and armor they laid by their heads, then sank down to sleep. But Grindel's mother kept thought of her sorrow, a she-one, a monster wife, in form like a woman. She dwelt 
Midst that waters terrors in the cold tarn, an outcast filled with hatred, greedy and dark of mood, she came to Herod to revenge her son. Into the hall she came stalking, and straightway was terror, there as in the days of Grendel. Some of the earls seized their weapons. Many in utmost confusion thought not of helmet or burney, but the monster was in haste and in no mood to linger. Quickly she seized in her grip one of the aethlings dearest to all to Hrothgar. Then in her other hand she grasped Grendel's arm, the trophy of victory, and made off to the fence. Loud was the outcry in Hero. Sorrow began anew, and the old king was stricken in spirit. From his rest was Beowulf fetched, the warrior crowned with victory. A steed with plated mane was bridled for Rothgar, and forth he fared with Beowulf midst a footband of warriors. They followed the track of the monster over the murky moors, along the forest ways, over the steep stone fells by beetling cliffs, and many a monster's lair, till they came to a mountain forest, dank and foul, the joyless wood, leaning over the poor hawk, and beneath it, a tarn of black and boiling waters. Above hung dark mists, and over all played a weird and fearful light. Here Beowulf bade farewell to his comrades, and hasted in his valor to plunge down into the waters. It was a day's while that he swam about, encountering many a monster ere he fell in with her he sought. Then a great claw laid hold on him, and dragged him down, down to a fearsome hall, a cavern at the tarn's bottom, where no water entered. By the light of fire, a flashing flame, he saw it was Grindel's mother who held him. Then the lord of the Geat shrank not at all from the strife, but seized the fiend by the shoulder. Long they struggled together. Useless was Beowulf's sword against such a she-one. He cast it aside, the strong and still-edged, set with jewels, and trusted once more to the might of his hand-grip. At last, spent in spirit, the fighter on foot, strongest of warriors, tripped, so he fell. Then the water-wife threw herself on him and drew her dagger, broad and bright-edged. So had the hero, foremost of fighters, gone to his death, had not holy God, the wise lord, held sway over the victory, awarding it aright. Among the war-gear on the cave's walls, the ruler of men vouchsafed it to Beowulf to see of a sudden a blade oft victorious, an old sword of the giants, doughty of edge and glory of warriors, choicest of weapons it was, save that it was greater than any man else might bear to the battle. Beowulf seized it, and smiting slew Grindel's mother. Steadfast of thought, the hero looked through the cavern, and finding where Grindel lay dead, bore off his head as token to Hrothgar that there lived no more such a doer of evil. Soon he was swimming, that he had borne erstwhile the battle shock of the foe. In his hand the war-brand, the sword, began to melt like an icicle, for foulness of the waters where demons had died, till naught remained but the hilt, decked with dragons. Up through the waters he dove, the safeguard of seafarers, the strong of heart, came swimming safely to land. Then went to him his chosen band of thanes, who alone had awaited his coming. God they thanked, for they had thought him dead, so long had he been in the water. Forth then they fared up the footpath, joyful of heart, bearing Grindel's head unto Hrothgar. In the hall, brave with gold, thus spake Beowulf, Lo, with joy we have brought thee, lord of the Skildings, in token of glory the sea-spoil thou hast beholdest. Not easily came I forth with my life. Almost had I been overborne, save that God shielded me, henceforth. I promise thee, thou mayest sleep in Herald, free from care, with thy fellowship of warriors. Thou needest no longer, O lord of the Sildings, have dread of death peril. Then the white-haired king kissed the best of thanes, and clasped him about the neck. With his tears fell for heartfelt thanks. 
Now that Beowulf's work was done, and Hiorot cleansed of demons, the Geatmen were eager to fare once more to their people. So the hero, great of soul, went with his earls, where his sea-goer rode at anchor. There they bade the spear-danes farewell, and stepped into their vessel, to fare forth over the swan road, over the whale path, homeward, to their geat. you for listening to my family book nook podcast subscribe to our blog at myfamilybooknook.blogspot.com and follow us on facebook pinterest and youtube at ghost horse hollow and ghost horse gift gallery to advertise with my family book nook contact pod beans pod ads program for more information Join us each Sunday afternoon at 4 p.m. Eastern Time USA for another episode in the exciting saga of the McKinnon Homesteaders, as well as stories from around the globe. Podbean.com podcasts are available through a convenient app on your PC, tablet, or cell phone. Listen anytime. We appreciate your sharing my family book nook episodes with your friends and family on social media. Watch it grow. Special thanks to the lovely Price Sisters on the web at thepricesisters.com for our closing music. Follow me on Instagram and underscore ghost underscore horse. This is Anne Severn Williamson and it's been a pleasure. <laughs>